All right. So uh, many of you, you know, have heard uh, buzz and, and and pieces of information about uh, the this amazing bread book project that's been work go, being worked on for the last four years, uh, Modernist Bread, by the same people who brought you Modernist Cuisine, which was a publishing phenomenon. What four or five years? Five years ago, I think, when it first came out, and uh, and uh, it's. I was fortunate enough to be a part of the early development of this new project, but it really came together when uh, the publisher, uh, Nathan Mirvold, was able to find and invite Francisco Magoya to become the lead uh, author and head baker for this project. And so he's been working on it. He's, I'm going to let him tell you all the rest from here on, and hopefully he'll be able to bring us up to date and maybe even give us a hint as to when it will hit the stands. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Francisco Magoya. <laughs> so when is a book coming out is a million dollar question. Um, it's fall is what we're saying. So fall is a good window that we're comfortable with. So um, it's, you know, we, it's five volumes. We have three already in the printer. Uh, so we're just finishing up the last two, so we, we're definitely looking at a fall on sale date. It's, uh, it's very complicated to distill in 45 minutes what a group of at least 26 people have been working on for four years. Uh, so I'm going to try to distill some of those moments of, I would say, just insights that we thought would be useful to you, insights that might, you know, bring some questions to you and... Uh, you know, there's going to be a Q&A after this if there's time. Hopefully there will be time. But, um, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what your questions would be regarding some of the material that we have here because we've, we've spent four years not just baking bread. Of course we've baked bread. We, we baked, uh, we calculated the other day, it was close to 50,000 pounds of bread that we baked. And that's, that's not production. That's just for research, just for experiments. And so... We did our homework, we did our due diligence, um, we used a lot of equipment and scientists to, to help us get to those answers. So, um, so with that, I will, I will get us started with, uh, with this presentation. So I always get goosebumps after I see this uh, short, like one minute video, and it's also a good reminder for me to not forget how much work went into it and how, uh, how big of a project this was, because when you're in it for four years, you kind of lose vision of the enormity of it. So um, this is uh, a set of our, what we, I mean, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Marnus Cuisine, we first published the book that is all the way to your left. It's a five volume book on cuisine. Uh, came out in 2011, and then f a couple years later, we had uh, Modernist Cuisine at Home come out, which is, um, you know, to some, it's the more approachable version of, uh, it says at home, but it's actually, a lot of professional bakers find it more practical than Modernist Cuisine. Um, and then our, the last book we published was uh, The Photography of Modernist Cuisine, which is basically a behind the scenes of how, um, of how we took the pictures in this book, because that's part of what we do. We don't just do all of the research and writing, et cetera, but the photography is, is equally important because it really tells a story in a way that words can't. You know, the cliche is a, a picture tells a thousand words. Well, it, it really does. And what we try to do, and I'll show a couple of pictures um, that we have of where we cut things in half. We like cutting things in half because we like looking into things. So uh, we've been published in a bunch of different languages, Chinese, French, German, Spanish. Um, 
the at-home versions as well, coming out in Arabic and Japanese. Um, this is super exciting. Uh, this is a gallery that we're opening in Las Vegas. In fact, we're opening tomorrow, and I'm flying out uh, to Vegas tomorrow. I know it's a super hard job, but somebody has to do it. <laughs> somebody has to go to Vegas. But it's a gallery in which we're going to have a large format photography of, um, of the food that we shoot. And um, so that's going to be there. And um, you know, if people want to buy pictures and hang them in their house with different size formats. I'm not trying to promote it. I'm just saying that's, that's what's happening next. Um, we also have this going on, which we're really excited about with uh, Heritage Radio Network. We have a podcast coming out. It's called uh, Modernist Breadcrumbs. And uh, where is he? He's interviewing. Well, Michael, who is uh, basically uh, the lead on this, he came up with a, I, I can't take, I could have taken ownership of that, uh, uh, what he calls one in his breadcrumbs, because he's not here, but he came up with that name, which I thought was very clever. It's a series of podcasts. We're going to do six different podcasts. It's not just us. We're, some of you were interviewed today by him. You're going to be part of that podcast. Um, where we're really going to be talking to people, not just bakers, farmers, millers, you name it, a bunch of people uh, are going to be part of this, uh, of this broadcast. This is the team, uh, Nathan Mirvel in the middle. This is a kitchen team. So um, we have a core staff of four chefs and one food scientist. We have contractors, too, who come in, you know, specialists in certain things that come in and out of the lab. Uh, we don't know everything. You know, it's, it's one of those things that and with bread, there's not one person who knows everything about bread. So our History chapter, we had a historian write. Our grain chapter, we had a grain expert write. Uh, you know, we had uh, a microbiologist write our microbiology chapter and so forth. So it's not just us. It's, this is a kitchen staff, but there's a bigger staff that, uh, that also contribute to the book. This is our lab. Um, I'm really proud of this lab. This is a newish lab. It's about a couple years old. Uh, you may be able to see here a couple things, but uh, I'm not going to go through every single piece of equipment, but what we have in our lab is a combination of three worlds. We have a professional bakery slash kitchen, but we also have lab equipment, but we also have home baking equipment. This is one of the big departures from Modernist Cuisine, the first book, which is we're going to not just write a book for professional bakers. Of course, it is for professional bakers, but it's also for everybody else who has interest in bread. So we baked our bread in a home oven. In fact, it wasn't just any home oven. It was probably the worst home oven we could find. <laughs> Because all re I, we found that most recipes are written for best case scenario. Flour is perfect, the water is at the right temperature, your oven is super well calibrated. When does that happen? Very infrequently. So we provide all the information that you need to successfully bake a loaf of bread. Of course, as most of you know, there is no replacement for practicing, right? Getting a good loaf of bread done in one shot, your first try, you got lucky. For the most part, you're going to have to practice. And so we make emphasis on those things as well. So anyway, that's our lab. Uh, that's what the book's going to look like. We have a, a dummy of it. I didn't bring it because it's enormous. But um, that's what it's going to look like. It's five volumes plus a kitchen manual. So if you want to be really like, strict about it, it's six volumes if you include the kitchen manual. Uh, same page size. Actually, I, I disagree. We're 200 pages longer than Modernist Cuisine. And that's that's. I will repeat that everywhere I go, because it's a little bit bigger than modernist cuisine. Um, 1,200 recipes, a million words, five research chefs, 75 writers, researchers, recipe testers, marketers, and editors. So we had a bunch of people test our recipes. Um, some of you are in, this, in here. Uh, Peter tested a bunch of our recipes as well. But we had pro bakers test our recipes, as well as home bakers, and restaurant bakers. It's a third group that a lot of people forget about. There's restaurant bakers, which is usually the pastry chef who the chef asks, hey, could you make some bread? Why not, right? It's the same thing. Um, and it's not. I know it's not the same thing. But a lot of people like, just put pastry chefs and bakers in the same, in the same room, and it's, it's a very different uh, skill set. But anyway, we have those people in mind as well. Uh, fall 2017, fingers crossed. All right, so that's the first volume. Our first volume is an in-depth look at the history and fundamentals of bread. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the bread on the right in a second, but this is one of my favorite pictures that we shot. It's one of my favorite because it's aesthetically, I think it's beautiful, but also because this is, uh, we gathered a bunch of historical recipes. 
you know, uh, recipes that were, I don't know, uh, in Roman times there were some recipes we had to kind of translate them into, you know, contemporary times because a lot of old book recipes, they say, add enough flour to the water and just a few eggs to make it feel like X, Y, or Z. And it's like, how is that a recipe? So you have to extrapolate a lot of that information, interpret it, and come up with something palatable. So these, we baked a bunch of them. They weren't all good. The ones that were really good, we do include a recipe in the book, but we at least tried them out. We wanted to see this whole thing about the best bread is in the past, and we wanted to see, take it out for a spin and see how, how it panned out. And so, um, great imagery, but also practical. So in the book, we point out what each bread is, what its story is, and whether it's any good. Uh, I think we have the most comprehensive visual guide of bread in art that has ever been compiled because old baking books didn't have pictures, right? So you really had to learn about what bread was like, mostly through photo uh, photo photography, paintings. Paintings would depict bread very often. And so you can learn a lot about bread by A, how it looks, B, what it was served on, um, and how people ate it, size, portion, the color. All, there's many things that can be gleaned from just looking at uh, and, and really taking in-depth looks at different paintings. So um, this was really cool. We, this was, a, uh, I guess, a reenactment is the best way to put it. Of, uh, this is a mural that was in Pompeii. Everybody knows what happened in Pompeii. It didn't fare very well with that volcano. Um, but it's a, it's a mural that has often been misinterpreted. It looks like it's a baker who is selling bread to uh, somebody who's very important. And actually, it's not. What it is is a, uh, the guy that's in white is actually an aristocrat. And it was seen as an act of generosity to just give bread out. And it was a way of... You know how you get caps now that said, make America great again? They used to give bread out. So um, I guess it's, uh, it's, nothing's changed. Um, but I did want to point out uh, over here the stamp, the bread stamp. That bread stamp is, a, is an actual bread stamp from Pompeii. Uh, you know, the, the folks who lived in Pompeii would be allotted certain amounts of flour. Um, they wouldn't bake the bread, they would take it to a baker and the baker would make and mix the dough. And so a stamp was a way to basically identify which bread was yours. Your bread was made with this flour. And that stamp is over 2,000 years old. And so that's, I think, one of the most prized possessions we have in our library because it's, I mean, the story that's behind it and how it's survived all this time and how it's like now in a, I mean, we baked in a, in a brand new Mive oven, uh, but it, it's, it, it has a, a rich story behind it. And these, these are things that, uh, I think make this project so special. Okay, so chapter two, ingredients. So in depth, obviously flour, grains, salt, water, um, you name it. I mean, this, this is where we have uh, the, the real guts of what, what bread makes. So uh, just a, a little backstory. When I was first interviewing for this position uh, and I was talking to Nathan Mirabold about it, in my mind I was thinking, how are we gonna write anything more than one volume? on something that has four ingredients. How is that even possible? Lo and behold, four years later, we're having to cut information out. We've had to trim our recipes in half. I mean, it's been so much that we had to draw a line somewhere. So where are you going to put a, a set of 10 volumes of book? People don't have encyclopedias anymore. So uh, we had to really, really pare down. Um, some of the things that we have in here is yeast, of course. So this is yeast. Uh, this is, we have a, a microscope at our lab. It's called a SEM, or a scanning electron microscope. It's different from a regular microscope. It basically, ba it's electrons uh, that bounce back and forth and they create an image. So we're able to get like, it's a 50K uh, amplification of an image. So this is yeast. The first thing I thought when I saw this is that yeast is adorable, right? <laughs> uh, they look like tiny minions. Um, <laughs> But the little things that you see that look kind of like belly buttons kind of are belly buttons because yeast does not reproduce. It's not like boy yeast and girl yeast meet and have yeast babies. Yeast buds. And so when it buds, it leaves that scarring behind on the yeast. So that's what those little marks on the yeast are. Uh, this is uh, an actual, you know how you see uh, drawings of, of a wheat kernel and it shows you 
um, all of the layers that it has and what's inside. We actually took a grain of kernel and we were able to take a, f a picture of it. So it's, it's not a drawing, it's an actual picture of what the components are of the grain. Uh, this was really cool. What we did is, uh, when we first started on this project, uh, the question was, well, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of bakers, there's a lot of bakers that make baguettes. Surely there's a consensus of how a baguette is made or what its composition is or how much water, salt, yeast, and uh, the short answer is that we found out that that's absolutely not the case. Um, we baked, these were just nine, I'm sorry, 12 examples of different uh, baguettes that we tested. They're all different. Uh, there is a, some that even had egg in them, some that had uh, like 4% salt. It was all over the map. Uh, so that was a bit of a eureka moment where we're like, well, bread is supposed to be pretty precise. I guess not as precise as pastry, a little bit more precise than cooking. How could there be this, this whole disparity with, uh, with something as simple as a baguette, right? So we baked them to find out you know, what's, what's behind all this. Is there, are there some that are better than others? Are we wrong? Is our recipe bad? So we basically tested all these. Some of them look pretty good, some of them not so good. You can see some tight crumbs. You see some irregular open crumbs, so those were pretty good. Um, but ultimately, and then some had like whole grains in them and seeds, and it's like, at what point is a baguette not a baguette anymore? Is a baguette just a shape or is a baguette a recipe? So, um, our third volume is about techniques and equipment. Uh, so, like I said, I like, we like cutting things in half. So we cut uh, this KitchenAid in half. Well, and when I say we, it was not me, but it was, uh, our lab is not just a kitchen, uh, we share, it's a really big space that we share with a bio lab, we share with a chemistry lab, uh, we share with a huge machine shop, and those machine shop guys are badass. I mean, they're, I would not want to mess with them, but they're, they have machines that can do this, and a lot of people think that we just take, like, let's say the KitchenAid, we throw it through a bandsaw or even a water jet, right, and it'll cut it right in half. And the answer is no, that's not at all how it's done. We, they actually have to take the whole thing apart cut each piece individually, and then put it back together again. And it's like, it's so perfectly flat. It's incredible how they do it. But it does help to, sh I mean, I've never seen a mixer cut in half. We have ovens cut in half as well. We have pressure cookers cut in half. We have a bunch of things that kind of give you that inside look at what's going on. It's like looking under the hood, so to speak, right, with a car. Uh, how bread bakes. You know, a lot of us think we know how bread bakes. Um, you know, there's, there's really a lot behind it that we, uh, didn't know four years ago, and now uh, we know a lot more about it, but it's not as straightforward as you might think. Um, we covered these ovens as well, of course, deck ovens, but we talked about home ovens, we talked about tandoor ovens as well. Um, combi ovens, convection ovens, uh, you name it. Uh, and speaking of tandoor ovens, we actually, we have a section to show you, teach you how to make a tandoor oven with just stuff you can buy at the Home Depot. So if you're ever inclined to make your own tandoor oven, you'll be able to. And it was like 300 bucks. So. Uh, and then we have two volumes of recipes. Volume four is uh, enriched doughs, lean doughs, uh, rye breads. This is a, a replica of a, a brioche. Uh, brioche is, is really old. I mean, brioche has been around for a while. This one is actually from 1670, a painting in the Louvre, and we, we did a replica of it. It's, it's really hard to get brioche to do that. <laughs> um, to do this and this. So essentially it was like super dry brioche, very high in egg, very low in sugar. Sugar tenderizes, as you know. Um, and so we, we really, between doing this one and doing that Pompeii bread, we probably did like 16 different versions of the Pompeii bread. Um, but it was all to get, A, to understand the recipes, and B, to understand what people were doing with bread at the time. Uh, things like, this, uh, you know, how do you really appreciate a baguette? What are the quality aspects of a baguette? Uh, Michael's going to talk about in the next talk about, uh, you know, flavor perception and how to taste. And so we, we cover somewhat that here. You know, what are the quality attributes? Because you can make a baguette, but you also need to know if you made a good baguette and you didn't make a good baguette. Um, the different spectrum of Maillard reactions and, you know, how, the crust, the crumb, how it should smell, how it should taste like. There's that yellow crumb that was mentioned earlier, you know. So these are quality attributes that, I mean, they could be subjective, of course. I mean, but at some point you have to come to a consensus as to what makes a good baguette and what doesn't make a good baguette. I know that a good baguette is not soft on the outside, 
right? I know that it should be, uh, you know, it should, when I break into it, it should shatter. I know that it shouldn't, uh, you know, rip apart. So, I mean, there, there's few things that we kind of agree upon, or I guess we should agree upon on what a good baguette makes. Volume five is uh, all of flatbreads. We do, uh, there's a section, uh, we're gonna look at it a little bit later, but it's basically water-treated breads, so pretzels, bagels, steamed breads. Um, and then I said flatbreads, but in the realm of flatbreads, I mean, you can write a five-volume book on flatbreads. Um, we didn't. Um, but we, we tried to get as many flatbreads as possible. The, the one unifying thing is that they had to be yeast. They had to have yeast. Not all flatbreads have yeast. So in our book, everything had to contain yeast. So uh, this, is, I, this is exactly what I was talking about. This is our, our chapter on, on these breads, water-treated breads, bagels, pretzels, and bao, which, you know, first impression, you look at it, and it's like, what, if I look at these three on the table, it doesn't seem like they have anything in common because, they, first of all, they come from some, such different cultures. But they all have a step in which water is involved very importantly. We, uh, we boil baguette, uh, bagels, we dip pretzels in lye, and then we steam uh, bao, steam buns. So there's that water component that goes beyond pressing a steam button in an oven. Uh, Gluten-free breads. It's a funny story here, at least it's funny to me. It's funny now. When we announced the book three and a half years ago, it was on Facebook, I think, like the second or third question was like, is there going to be a volume or a chapter on gluten-free breads? We just told you it's going to be a book about bread. <laughs> You're asking if there's going to be something that is not bread in the book. Um, <laughs> And the answer was always yes, but that was immediately, and that made us realize, you know, there, we're going to have to put a lot of weight into this chapter because it's, I guess there's an expectation. There's an expectation because there's a lot of really bad gluten-free brands. Um, I think we nailed it. I think we're, we're you know, we have a, a few uh, techniques and methods in it that, I mean, you're never going to get it to be exactly one-to-one. -one. It's not, although our brioche probably is because it's 50%, our gluten-free brioche is like 50% butter, so if you toast it, to me it was, we gave it to a few people, and they, they, they could not tell that it was a gluten-free brioche. But other, not all gluten-free breads are brioche. There's other, there's other versions of it. So I think we, we came, uh, I would say, 90 95% close to you know, making gluten-free bread look, or, and not look, but taste. Very important, that textural component of a bread that gluten-free breads are missing. And then this is our recipe manual. Our recipe manual is basically the portable version of the five volumes, so all of the recipes, so that you can take it into your kitchen, so you don't have to take your five volumes set into the kitchen. Um, I mean, it weighs what a bag of flour weighs. So, well, a 50-pound bag of flour. Um, and so this is the, the portable version. It's made with paper that is, you know, it's water resistant, so you can wipe it off, and if anything falls on it, it's okay. All right, so who is this book for? Everybody here, I hope. Home bakers, restaurant chefs, professional bakers, and industry professionals. So it's, the idea was to not make it exclusive of one group of people. The idea was to make it open so that many people could benefit from the information in this book. Uh, everything that we did, we're going we're gonna to have a, a like, a, 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 later that says, uh, you know, what the numbers were exactly, but we did close to 1,500 experiments. So it's 1,500 experiments in three and a half years. That's a lot of experiments per day. And why did we do so many experiments? We did so many experiments because if we're going to say something that, you know, might ruffle somebody's feathers, we better be able to back it up. And so this is, uh, you know, we have uh, two people in that uh, image that still work for us. There's two uh, other contractors, food scientists as well. We were able to procure a bunch of testing equipment, uh, not buy because a lot of it is super expensive. Uh, Alveograph, uh, you know, Extensograph, all these things, they cost a lot of money. But fortunately, these companies, they lent them to us, and we were able to use a texture analyzer. Actually, we own the texture analyzer. But um, we have a, a, in the back corner is a thing that's called a C-scan, which basically lets you look at alveoli distribution which is mostly used for industrial production, but we said, well, let's try and look at artisan bread and see what artisan bread looks like in here. It actually turns out some pretty cool images. So. And actually, in your calendars, the picture that looks like Andy Warhol worked on, it's, it's actually the images that that machine spits out. Uh, so there's a reason behind, behind those images and what they do. 
Okay, so database. A database basically consisted of procuring a large library of bread books and then taking recipes from those bread books and putting, putting them into an Excel spreadsheet. It was a little challenging because a lot of bread books used volume instead of weight, so we had to do a bunch of volume conversions into weight. Um, but the whole idea was to, for example, find this whole baguette thread. Is there a common thread with baguettes? Um, and then we went into brioche and we went to country breads, et cetera. And there was a, a big, uh, a big, it was a year long effort with a couple of people working, you know, five days a week on it. 300 books, eight source languages, 4,300 recipes, 109 brioche recipes, 120, these are just some numbers from, from the, uh, the whole database calling. Uh, baguette recipes, it's a lot of entries, uh, but it's, what is, is definitely a positive about working on modernist cuisine is that we were able to get somebody to sit down and just spend time looking at all these books. The database, we almost reached the end of Excel. Have you ever reached the end of, the end of Excel? <laughs> There's a point where Excel tells you, you can't, you gotta really stop adding <laughs> because this is getting too big. And, and we almost got there. We almost got to the end of Excel. <laughs> Uh, this was really cool. This you can actually do with, I was going to say with things you get at Radio Shack, but Radio Shack doesn't exist anymore. Um, but these are all things that you can buy on Amazon. So we built a 3D scanner, and the reason why we built a 3D scanner, uh, if you can see this, uh, this basically is a scanner. This is an arm that spins, you know, 360 degrees back and forth. This actually rotates, has like a motor here, so it rotates. And the idea is that this would produce an image like this. And the reason why we want an image like this is if, let's say we're testing volume, the effect of bran and germ on volume of bread. Or we wanted to test how much, how many sprouted grains can we put in a loaf of bread before it starts to lose its volume. Or, very importantly, when you start to add fat, sometimes you increase volume with small percentages, but there's a threshold where it starts to kind of lose volume. So, this allowed us to really measure volume very accurately. You can't take a tape measure and start measuring bread. I mean, bread is organically shaped, but a 3D scanner can do it like perfectly. Uh, a lot of our photography, I mean, we did all our photography. Nathan did a lot of, uh, he didn't do the step-by-step -step shots, but he did a lot of like, a lot of the pictures that are on your calendar, he shot them. Um, some things we discovered about bread. So, I mean, a lot of things. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these today because, I mean, it's, it's a lot of information and this is really just an introduction to the project, but um, there were, there's a series of things that we call aha moments um, and we have all of that in the book and we explain it. We even have a section that is bread mysteries. Um, the reason why I call it bread mysteries is because we weren't able to find an answer to certain things. And we're okay with that because, you know, there's all, more, all the more reason to continue to explore and investigate and research, but there, there were things that we definitely uh, did not learn by the time we were done with this project. So, uh, one of the tricks that we developed, I don't like to use the word tricks, hack maybe, a better way to put it, uh, handling high hydration doughs. So, uh, high hydration doughs, unless you're Chad, uh, it's gonna be very hard to handle these doughs unless you have that experience, that know-how, and that just, that, that muscle memory to handle very wet doughs, it's very hard to handle them. They stick to your hands, they stick to the table, um, and that, that finessing that comes with practice and experience uh, takes years, it takes years. I don't know how many people could just up and start making high hydration breads and um, successfully execute them, like even within a couple of weeks. So we developed a technique that you know, essentially utilizes a low hydration dough, but we introduce water a different way. The water is introduced by adding basically gelled water. So if we have 69% hydration, what we do is we take 31% gelled water, the equivalent to bring it up to 100% hydration, and we incorporate it as if we included an inclusion. When you mix inclusions into a dough, you mix, let's say, your sprouted grains, add it in, low gluten, I mean full gluten development or whatever gluten development you go to, but you incorporate it as an inclusion. It turns out you can do the same thing with gelled water. And what happens with gelled water is that when it bakes, the water is going to evaporate and it's going to leave a big pocket inside your dough. So this allowed us to create like very high hydration doughs without the burden of having to handle a very wet uh, high hydration dough. 
If you're vegetarian, you wouldn't be able to eat it, but that's a different story. Um, proofing in a wine fridge, uh, we, we like cold proofing. Cold proofing sourdoughs is really great for sourdoughs, but not all fridges go beyond 39 degrees Fahrenheit. So a, a quick and easy fix was to just use a wine fridge. You can get a wine fridge up to 55 degrees Fahrenheit easily. Not everybody has a proof or retarder. But you could afford a wine fridge. This was 55 bucks at the Home Depot. Uh, there's bigger ones. Restaurants have them. Proofing your bread in there 14 hours overnight produces a beautiful sourdough. Um, and you know you can hold it with your wine. So <laughs> uh, this was very interesting too. This is uh, well, obviously it's a time lapse, but the time lapse doesn't really tell the story about why uh, steam makes bread crispy. Um, Steam is a bit misunderstood as to what its role is and how it affects bread and what it's doing to the bread, well, dough really, while it's baking and becoming bread. So I'm going to try to give you the uh, cliff notes on, on how, how uh, we basically discover. It's not a discovery. It's basically an understanding of how steam works. So this is essentially there's, there's things that are called in the world of physics, they're called heat pipes. And I, I know that you guys just had lunch, and this might be a little bit dense, and I might put a few of you, uh, some of you are sleeping already, so just, just try to, <laughs> I'll try to not wake everybody up. Um, but essentially, the way it works is steam, when you inject steam into your oven, what you're doing is the steam is creating uh, this like cloud on top of the bread. But what it's doing is it's taking the temperature of the surface of a bread up to steam temperature. So the common thinking is that steam escapes bread. And the answer is that, yes, it eventually will. But steam, just as a matter of physics, steam likes to go where it's coldest. Because where it's hottest, it's just going to dissipate. So where does it go? Steam goes to the inside of the bread, where it's coolest. So how does it get there? It gets there through what, are, what we're calling uh, it's, calling, it's called a heat pipe effect. So essentially what it does is you have your CO2 bubbles. The steam within the bubble evaporates, condenses, goes to the other extreme of the bubble. It condenses there. It pops, goes into the other bubble, condenses there, pops, goes to the other bubble until it reaches the core of the bread. So what I'm also trying to say at the same time is that the steam is going to go to the core of the bread. Once the core of the bread reaches about 208, 210, steam is going to start to escape. And that's when your steam goes out. But something very interesting here is that if you ask me how many bubbles are inside a loaf of bread, what do you think I'm going to tell you? It's not hundreds and it's not thousands. Some scientists say it's only one bubble. Think about it. Every bubble has to pop. So if every bubble pops, every bubble is connected, and therefore it's a single bubble. So that's a little bit mind-blowing because you look at bread and it's like, what do you mean? I'm looking at all these breads. But next time you cut into a loaf of bread, look at the alveoli. Is it intact or does it have a little tear somewhere? It's going to have a little tear somewhere. All the bubbles in your bread are connected. So that was kind of eye-opening. It's not going to change the way you break, bake. It's not going to change the way you introduce steam into your oven. What it's going to change is how you look at steam and its role in baking. It still makes that crispy crust. It still makes all these things happen, sure. But the order in which it happens is slightly different when you look at it from this perspective. And there's a perspective of physics. It's not a perspective of we think it happens that way. That's how steam likes to act. Steam doesn't want to go where it's hottest. Steam wants to go where it's coolest. So first in and then out. Rye flour. So this was a bit of an eye opener to us as well. So I don't know how many here have bakeries. Some of you might have bakeries where you sell rye breads. And I'm, I don't want to speak generally, but it's probably not your most popular breads. Um, we're not a country of rye eating, rye bread eating folks. Uh, there's some pockets, yes, if you go to you know, somewhere in New York, if you go to Minnesota, where there's a big Scandinavian uh, community, there's, there are some pockets that, that do consume rye breads. But it's not your most popular bread, I'm willing to bet. Um, and by the way, I'm not talking about rye flavor breads, breads where you add 10, 15 percent rye. That doesn't count. I'm talking about 100 percent. Um, why is this? Because for the most part, these are denser breads. Some people call them brick-like. We call them brick-like, but not in a negative way. I mean, they're kind of like brick. Um, 
But the, what was kind of eye-opening to us is we had a couple of bakers come to our lab, I would say, over two years ago, two Austrian bakers. And they wanted to just hang out and make bread with us. And as a gift, they wanted to make a, their rye bread with us to show us how they make it and have us taste it. Um, and they start mixing it. And he, the baker goes to me and is like, I can't work with this. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's rye flour. Why can't you make rye bread with this rye flour? And he said, well, this is shit. <laughs> um, actually, he said it in German, which is even funnier. Um, das ist scheiße. Yeah. Um, and so I said, well, we've been using it. It works fine. I've always liked rye bread. So I mean, for me, whether it's dense or not, it didn't matter tremendously. So, but he's like, no, I'm going to send you a bag of flour. And you can make flour, uh, your breads with this flour, and you tell me what you think. So you know what? Like getting a 50-pound bag of flour from Austria to the United States is no easy task. Um, flour is cheap. Shipping it is not. Uh, so we got this 15-euro, uh, 60-kilo bag of rye flour that cost 400 euros to ship. The most expensive. But we had to know. We had to know what's the big deal. What is this guy talking about? And so what he was talking about was this. His flour, which is the one that we utilized here, this is the same recipe. Again, I'm not saying this is better than that. What we didn't know is that we can make rye breads that have a very similar texture and consistency to wheat breads, which is kind of unheard of because rye doesn't have gluten. Rye has very different components. How do you make for a nice, chewy rye bread? The answer is you have to write, find the right flour. This flour specifically is uh, uh, Austrian rye flour. It's, it's a T960. That's the ash, ash content. Um, there are many different kinds of rye flours. Uh, if you're from Germany or Austria or um, countries in that area, you, you, you know that flour, rye flours are, are deeply categorized. There's many varieties. Um, but also, very importantly, there are most of those rye flours are grown for human consumption. Not to say that the rye wheat, uh, the rye berries, rye kernels here are not uh, fit for human consumption, but the majority of rye in the United States is grown as a cover crop. What does that mean? It means that we're going to grow rye, so it will put nutrients in the soil, and we're going to throw the rye out, or we're going to give it uh, for animal feed. Very little of it is meant for human consumption. So as a result, there hasn't been a huge amount of research into um, rye flour in the United States. We, obviously, you go to Germany and you go to Austria, you're going to get people who really devote their lives to creating better strands of, uh, of rye flour. And so it was a big revelation to us to be able to do this. And then we thought, OK, so are we really going to tell people in our book to buy a 400 euro bag of rye flour from, which by the way, you, you can't just like ship it in. Uh, there's tricks to it, and I'll be happy to tell you how to do it, how to get through the USDA for it. Um, I, I'm gonna tell you because it's kind of funny. If the person who is exporting the flour to you writes a happy birthday card on it, like it's a gift, it'll go right through customs. <laughs> I don't know why. I have no idea why that is, but that's just the way it is. So every month, our assistant gets a birthday present from Austria <laughs> that says, happy birthday, Carla. Um, so then we were thinking, OK, we need to start uh, contacting different mills and seeing uh, who has looked into rye flour the most, who has this uh, like really high quality rye that would replicate this. And we did a lot of trials. We tested many different rye flours. Again, it's not that. I didn't think that they were bad. What I didn't think is that we were not getting this volume. Eventually, we did come to two really great uh, uh, millers. Uh, first and foremost, Jay from Bay State. I owe you this one. Um, they make a fantastic light rye flour. And our results were almost verbatim to the, uh, the, T, the, T9, the Austrian T960. So if you want to talk to Jay later, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's the man to speak to. Uh, and then also Bob's Red Mill. Why is, why is it important? Because it was pretty much the only commercially available for small uh, production uh, light rye flour in the market that you could actually go to Whole Foods and buy light rye flour. And it gave us similar results, not as good as Bay State, 
but it's more readily available. So this was one of our uh, a big, uh, I would say, eye-opening moments in the book. Not as cool as this one. Um, this one, this one I, I, I'm, I, I really, I'm a huge fan of this one. So I saw this guy, he's an Italian guy, and he started baking panettones in a jar. Um, and then I thought, okay, well, let's try it out and see if it works. And so I made a panettone dough, I put it in a jar, put the lid on it, and baked it. And I baked it with the lid, that's key. I wasn't supposed to do that, but I did. And then, you know, I was, when, I, when I put it in the oven, I told everybody to just walk away. We'll come back in 45 minutes if it explodes in the oven. <laughs> We're good. And so we came back 45 minutes. It was baked. And then I, as I opened the door, I, was, I actually put eye protective gear. And I, what if this thing explodes on me, right? It didn't. It cooled down. And the next day, I just left it. And then I left it for a month. And I left it for two months and three months and then four months. And there wasn't a single mold spore on it. So then we're like, well, this has to be stale. I mean, this, ha I mean, this is a four-month-old four loaf of bread. So I opened the jar, and first and foremost, the aroma of the panettone was amazing. I mean, it just concentrated the vanilla and the candied fruit and just the lemon. Everything was just, it was almost too much. But OK, so now let's taste it. It wasn't stale. Why wasn't it stale? It wasn't stale because it was canned. Why does that matter? Because anything that was in that jar, namely even the water that's within the dough, has nowhere to go. It can't move. It can't go from point A to point B. It can't recrystallize the starch. So it stays in place. So this was very exciting, of course. So we were like, OK, now let's test every single bread. <laughs> uh, and so. I'm going to give you the short answer. You can't do it with every type of bread. It doesn't work for every kind of bread. Obviously, you're not going to get a crusty baguette in there, but you can get a pretty nice sandwich bread that is round. Uh, it worked great for like really dense pumpernickels. Volkenbrots worked great. Um, we also pressure cooked them as well. So we put them in a pressure cooker. Uh, not everything worked with the pressure cooker, but we have a huge table in our book that basically gives you instructions for the different breads that work in this environment how to do it, um, and uh, you know, what works and what doesn't work. What's very interesting is that I later learned that this Italian guy, he didn't bake with the lid on. <laughs> and I'm glad I didn't know that, because I would have never thought to keep the lid on. So he bakes it with the lid off when they come out, and they're still warm, puts the lid on, closes it. And yes, as it cools down, it creates a vacuum. But it's not as good of a vacuum. Um, and so this is allowed. I still have breads that are probably seven months old intact. So, you know, I think this is a pretty cool thing. Is it practical? It depends. I mean, it depends on what you're using it for. The jars that I really like because they're pretty, the Le Parfait jars and ball, uh, there's a brand Le Parfait and Weck jars. They're beautiful, but they're not cheap. But we also try it with ball jars. Ball jars are pretty reasonably uh, priced. So. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know that it has a commercial purpose. But I know that it's a very special gift that you could give somebody. So um, is that uh, frozen levant for impromptu sourdough? This might not trouble too many people who are professional bakers, but maybe home bakers, yes, because I feed my sourdough. I'm not going to make bread today. What am I going to do with all this extra levant? I'm going to throw it away. So we did a little bit of math. Well, the math was if. I have, let's say, a small jar of Levan in my house and because I'm a home baker. And I feed it every day. I'm going to use volume just for you know, practical purposes. But I feed it you know, a cup of flour every day. By the time you have 365 days of just adding that one cup of flour, it is 100 pounds of flour. Just going to the trash, unless you bake bread. So, one of the things that we recommend to people is don't throw it out. Why would you not throw it out? Even though it may have lost its leavening ability, it still has a flavor. right? So you have all this lactic acid bacteria that did all this work. You have all the yeast that did its part two. You have flour that's already been hydrated. So how about you just freeze it, and the next time you need it, you thaw it, and you just add some commercial yeast. 
it's a pretty simple, straightforward way of just utilizing a product that would have gone in the trash. Add a little bit of yeast, the flavor's already there. You're already gonna get the shelf life. Just add 0.5% yeast and you're gonna have a nice loaf of bread. And that's what this was. So, uh, proofing, it's cool. It's just a cool thing to look at. Uh, so you know what we didn't figure out? And much to my chagrin because I thought we would, but it's a different, a different method for testing proof than using your finger on the dough. There is no better way. We, came, we devised all these gadgets and things and whatnot. Nothing will compare to the experience of doing a finger test on the dough. So there you have it. Ah, dough CPR. It's a little bit of a cheesy name that we came up with. It's carbohydrate protein resuscitation. <laughs> we had to make it work. Uh, but so what is this? So should I spoil the, yeah. Well, so anyway, how many times, maybe you haven't, but surely you can imagine somebody overproofing dough <laughs> and throwing it in the garbage, right? Ah, all this time spent on this, now I have to throw it away. What happens when dough is proofing? When dough is proofing, the uh, bubble walls are getting thinner and thinner and thinner, so they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So they can only hold so much CO2, they can only hold so much ethanol. There's gonna be a point where they pop, and that's what typically of a proofing results in is popped bubbles. Also, that alcoholic smell, right? Because yeast, that's what it produces. Uh, so the walls are thinning and the bubbles are getting too big, so there's a collapse. So what we thought is like, okay, so if we overproof a dough, and then what happens if we reshape it, put it back in a basket, and try to proof it again? You can. In fact, you can do it up to 10 times. Now, you can see it's starting to, the loaf was starting to get really firm down here. It was starting to get, you know, because you're developing gluten every time you reshape. But I would hope that you didn't forget your dough 10 times in the proof box. <laughs> that would, it was kind of to prove a point. Um, so does it work for every dough? Kind of, sort of. It works mostly for doughs that are made with commercial yeast. Because uh, commercial yeast is super strong. I mean, it's resilient, like very few living things are. You can freeze it, you can proof it, you can, you know, it can, you can do all these things to it and it'll come back. Uh, and rich doughs didn't fare so well. I mean, they baked well, but the color was a little lacking on top. Sourdoughs, we can only rescue once, only once. Uh, that's all you need though, right? Just, oh, I forgot it, oh crap, okay, let me just redo it again and then put it back in the proofer. So uh, next time that happens, don't throw it away. Just reshape it, be a little more patient, set a timer this time, uh, and then make sure you get back to it on time. Uh, we tested how much water can you mix into dough? I mean, what's the maximum you can go to? And you, I mean, there's, there is a threshold where you, you have to stop. I mean, obviously, it really uh, depends on the flour you're using. Uh, we utilized, for all these tests, we utilized uh, central milling, uh, artisan baker's craft, and because it's a readily available flour. And so we baked, uh, we went, you know, obviously we started at 80, 90, 100, so 110 was still good, 120 was still good, but that's it. Uh, 130 looked like, you know what it looked like? It looked like an eclair, a cream puff. It was hollow on the inside. It's just, it was too much for the flour. In fact, we had to put it in a pan, it was just like, batter. Um, taking fat to the max, how much fat can you add? I was talking earlier about, you know, a little bit of fat does increase volume in things. 2% is the sweet spot. That's why you'll see some ciabatta recipes have a little bit of fat in them. Uh, some focaccia recipes have a little fat. Little tiny bit, 2%. This is in leanish doughs. If you go higher than that, you're going to start to lose volume, as you see. Brioche is a bit of a different animal. Uh, yeah, you can put a lot of, a lot of butter into this is 110% butter, which means that there's more butter than flour in the dough. Uh, I mean, for practical purposes, how much would you sell this loaf of bread for? I mean, <laughs> but, but that's where it stopped. Uh, above 110, there was no structure. It could not support it. So now you know the limit. You could go higher, right? If you add vital wheat gluten, you add more eggs, but then you're just playing a game of balancing the rest of your ingredients. So with a standard recipe, with a, a a control recipe, this is as far as we could go with water and with fat. Uh, sourdough for sweetbreads, so panettone. I love panettone, it's one of my favorite things when it's done well. Um, it's, it's, 
it's like cake, it's like bread cake. Uh, but it takes a long time. And so one of the things that we took a look at was uh, yeast. And if you think of yeast as a pet, it helps because you can train it. Uh, you can train it to live in very warm environments. You can train it to live in cold environments. You can train it to not eat every day. It adapts, and what, that's what I'm getting at. Yeast will adapt. It's one of the most adaptable uh, organisms uh, known to man. Not as much as cockroaches, but thankfully we don't have to <laughs> deal with that. But um, part of the reason why panettone takes so long is because this dough is in a, and it creates an environment for the yeast of high osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is basically, um, it pulls water away. It pulls water away from the yeast. Uh, a, an example of something that has a very high osmotic pressure is honey. Honey will never go bad. Even though there's water in honey, it creates such osmotic pressure that it won't share any of that water with bacteria or anything else. So that's why honey never goes bad. And its own is very high in sugar, super high in sugar. So that yeast has to basically fight for water and for food. So what we thought is like, what if we train it to like to live in that environment? What's the worst that can happen? It won't leaven. And you can. And if you try, if you just take your live on and you feed it up to 20% sugar, you know, twice a day, by the third day, you're gonna have an osmotolerant live on. So where did this idea come from? It came from because, you know, you go to Le Safra or you go to, uh, you know, whoever produces commercial uh, yeast, they have, you know, yeast for lean breads and then they have yeast that is, uh, uh, for high osmotic pressure, sweet doughs, okay, the gold label. It's because that yeast is trained to live in that environment. But what if you did that with wild yeast? You absolutely can. So what we did is we trained our live on to like to live in the exact same amount of sugar that exists in a panettone. So basically it shaves the proofing time down in half. Um, why? Because yeast has no problem living in there. It's been trained to get to that point, and once it reaches that point, it actually needs to have that sugar in its environment. So um, you can do as little as 5% or as much as 20%. And although very few breads have 20% sugar. I mean, 20% is a lot, but it can, it can handle it. Uh, purees and breads. Well, I mean, you don't have to put purees and breads, but if you wanted to, we have an entire table dedicated to which ones you can add. It's a starting point. Uh, it's a way of uh, adding flavors and adding uh, different textures to bread. Not all purees will have the same effect on bread. Um, we had a hollow spinach puree. I'm not sure if it's kosher or not, but you know, I guess it is. Uh, bagel with red pepper puree. Brioche with purple yam. French lean bread with raspberry. Uh, the role of mixing is misunderstood. What do we mean by this? What do we mean is that it's the same thing as we mean when we're talking about steam and the role of steam. So we're thinking about mixing, and we attribute everything to mixing to the machine, when in reality, it's the water and the flour that are doing all the work. What does the machine do? The machine just speeds it up. But this is why, if you think of Jim Leahy's method for no-need bread, the reason why it works is because you leave water and flour long enough alone, they're going to form gluten. It's going to form gluten. So we don't have a crust section uh, picture of these, but this and this is going to be a lot yellower inside than these and these. So it really depends on what you're going for. The Vanover mix method for mixing, in case you haven't heard of it, it's this guy in Connecticut. His name is Charles Vanover, or Charlie if you know him. Uh, he devised this method, which is it's cool, but it goes pretty much against like a lot of things that a lot of people believe about bread. What does he do? He puts all the ingredients in a roboku or a food processor. 45 seconds, you have a dough. And you proof it, you both ferment it for an hour, proof it for an hour, and you have bread. So we can judge that until we're blue in the face, or we can say, you know what, that's really cool. But it really helps to explain why the machine is only responsible for forcing water into the flour. The flour and the water are doing all the work. So it's, for me, it was a bit of a paradigm shift because it helps me understand how machines, what machines do and what water and flour are doing better. It's forcing water into the flour. Okay. I love this one. It's going to upset some people, but that's okay. I, the exit is right there. Um, <laughs> so there's different, uh, different schools of thought of how you inoculate 
water. I inoculate, I mean add a lot of living things, lactic acid, bacteria, and yeast to water so that you have this, I guess, uh, a large amount of, uh, of, of living things in that water that are going to basically create this super strong levant. And so, talking about yeast again, so there's many different kinds of yeasts, many different kinds. There are yeasts that live on grapes that like to eat, guess what? The stuff that's on grapes. There's yeast that eventually becomes a raisin, uh, becomes uh, part of the raisin, it's sim similar, it changes a little bit, but that yeast likes to eat what's on the raisin. Guess what it doesn't like to eat? The yeast that is in your flour. The yeast that is in your flour likes to eat the sugars from the starches in your flour. It already lives there. You don't need to add anything else to that environment. So what you're looking at here has a name. It's called a false positive. So it's important to look at the first tub, the raisins and water. We inoculated it for five days, sufficient enough time for the yeast to basically make its way into the water and to create more yeasts and whatnot. Uh, the second one, actually we killed all the yeast in the second one. How did we kill it? We put the raisins in the water inside a pressure cooker. You put anything in a pressure cooker, it's going to die. So how do you explain that one? All you did by pressure cooking the raisins in the water is break down the sugars in the raisins so that the yeast in the flour could have something to eat, a quick bite, fast food if you will. Now, unless you're going to continue to add raisin water to your Levon, you're wasting your time. Don't put apricots in there, don't put apples, don't put, I've heard people put an onion in their sourdough. What are you doing? The yeast that you need is already in the flour. And that, as long as I continue to add water and flour to it, it's going to continue to live its life. And if I continue to add raisin water, sure, it'll have those yeasts in it, but it's not contributing anything. If I start my starter with raisin water, I, you know, some folks say I can taste the raisins in it. You can't. You want to. <laughs> you really want it to be. But there's no way, you're even if you tried to do like Welch's sourdough, <laughs> you probably could not taste the grapes in there, and Welch's is very powerful. Um, so that's a bit of a story, and that's, that's a lot of, of, of what we find with a lot of things that people want to believe about bread is that they have a good story. And that's okay. Stories are good, but science is better. Um, because science is going to tell you definitively yes or no, most of the time. Okay, I'm still here. The tomatoes are being thrown. Good. Yet. Uh, so, how are we doing on time? Time for Q and A. Perfect. All right. So that's all I got, and uh, let's have some questions. Okay. I'm ready. All right. <laughs> well, if that doesn't raise any questions, I don't know what will. For individual questions regarding what you heard today, anybody have anything for Francis? Um, did you include anything on pre-ferments or different kinds of pre-ferments like biga, poolish, papermente, that yes. kind of thing? A hundred percent, yes. Um, had a, you know, in, in fact, for like pre-ferments like Levan, how often to feed them for a particular flavor profile, uh, where to store them, like. Pretty much everything to train your yeast. So, uh, absolutely. Sounds like a, a, boils, a lot of it boils down to training your yeast to do what you want it to do. Or Give it a name. What you want it to do. That's what we do. Mine is LeVon James. <laughs> <laughs> so. When you baked your bread in jars, did the jars have uh, rubber? Gaskets or what? Yes, that's a great question. Um, and the, uh, ooh, setting the mood. <laughs> um, so it's, you can't go above 350 degrees Fahrenheit. And some ovens are quirkier than others. So we baked in a Mive combi oven. It was fine. And we baked in a, uh, not a Mive, a Mive convection oven. And then we baked in a home oven and then in a combi, a rationale combi. 
Rational economy is like super harsh. So the way around that is if you put foil on the gasket, it, it's fine. It won't affect the, the, the rubber gasket. So that's a great question. What about the, the cap like it usually is? Fine. It, tends, it, tends, it didn't melt. It didn't melt. No, and you, the, but the thing is don't go above 350, which is why like you can't put a ciabatta in there. You know I mean? It's not, you know, you have to manage your expectations too. It's like if you put a sourdough and you're hoping for like this, you know, super open crumb structure, it's not going to have that. Uh, that's why enriched breads work so well with that. Um, for the mo and and either re either enriched or really dense breads like Vulcan Brown and Pumpernickel. <laughs> well, you know, a cinnamon bun in there is awesome because you know you bake it in there, you can re-therm it, open it, and serve some warm glaze on top of it. It's awesome. <laughs>